Thanks, Leslie, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation to come and speak. Um, it's lovely to see many of those I recognize, especially nice to see Eileen and um, Brian. I know you've been through some pretty tough times lately, so very good to see you here as well. And um, all right, um, I was asked to speak on COVID and capitalism. Um, back in April, I, I wrote a piece on, on this question with uh, Titi Bhattacharya, and more recently, I um, wrote a review of Andreas Malm's wonderful book on capital, uh, climate, capitalism, and COVID, and there's a review of it in, in RS21 on the website. I'm going to draw on those pieces a little bit, but I don't want to just regurgitate them, and I haven't really prepared a properly integrated, crafted talk. I'm just going to air half a dozen ideas to get some discussion going. So let's kick straight off with um, the pathogenesis of the problem, the COVID the causation of COVID, its generation and the role of capitalism in that. I'm not going to say very much on this. It's um, rather abstract, but, uh, but very important. Um, the the go-to um, theorists of this are, are Rob Wallace and Mike Davis, I would say. Um, but if you're, if you're interested in this, there's also wonderful summaries of the, of the role of capitalism in producing uh, zoonotic diseases uh, in Andreas Malm's book and a very condensed um, summary of it in the review I've, I've written of Malm, but um, because I think Marxists such as Davis and Wallace are absolutely right to pin the part, at least a major part of the production of COVID, its genesis, um, its pathogenesis on the mode of production. So we're saying, you know, capitalism, this almighty clusterfuck is on your account as well as everything else. Um, this is yet another symptom of the metabolic rift, the alienation of humanity from the natural world. Um, Michael Friedman puts it very well in a, in a piece in Inspector. COVID pandemic has drawn global attention to connections between human, human and ecosystem health. If you degrade the eco health of the planet, you'll, it'll have knock on effects on human health as, as well as we're seeing with COVID. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to go into the details of that argument. I, I would draw two, two points. I think two points are worth bearing in mind um, in, in respect of that argument that capitalism causes COVID. One is that we're not yet absolutely definitively sure how COVID arose. I mean, in a, Rob Wallace, in, a, in an interview in Spectre, he raises the possibility that it may have been held in labs and uh, held in a lab and escaped from there. It's, it's, he doesn't rule it out, although it seems unlikely. The other thing I think worth bearing in mind is that when we say COVID is caused, in a, in a sense, by capitalism, I mean, uh, epidemics of this sort obviously are not new to capitalism. Capitalism is, is accelerating, is heating up the pathogenic soup that was long ago created by other forms of class society. Um, on this question, um, James Scott's book, Against the Grain, is absolutely fascinating. I'd recommend it highly. Um, he speaks of the late Neolithic period, the time of the tran transition from pre-class society to agriculture. He talks of the late Neolithic as a multi-species resettlement camp because it was then that it was, so hu human beings were becoming sedentary with agriculture, with towns, and so on. And humans in the process were becoming a herd-like animal, much more herd-like than they had been before, just at the moment when we were also becoming parasitic on actual herd animals. Um, and it was in this mixing of herds that the great zoonosis took place, spewing out all these awe-inspiring diseases that any little piece of COVID DNA would worship if it had religion. Diseases like smallpox, bubonic plague, typhus, cholera, measles, mumps, maybe malaria as well, and so on. So in this way, COVID is reminding us of the, yet again, uh, of the greatest challenge facing humanity, which is how to live with nature without completely trashing it, destroying it. No previous class, class society managed it very well particularly well. Pre-class societies obviously did. And, you know, by the way, I, this is a bit of a digression, but I always thought I'm struck by the astonishing radicalism of Marx and Engels when they, they were writing in the 19th century in, in Victorian England, the epicenter of ideology of progress the, and, and of social Darwinism, the idea that those with guns 
and dinner jackets are the, represent the pinnacle of civilization. And here were Marx and Engels saying, well, actually, these savages in, in pre-class societies, they, there were elements of utopia in, the, in, in their form of society from which we can learn. I think it's an astonishingly radical statement, especially for the times that it was being written in. But anyway, that's a digression. So that's all I want to say on, on the pathogenesis. Let's shift to move on to the epidemiology. The role of capitalism in turning COVID into a killer is not just it's, it's producing the conditions for its emergence, deforestation and so, and so on, it's pathogenesis, as I've just been discussing. It's also how the disease interacts with human beings within social matrices. So that's its epidemiology. And we've all, all, all of us have suddenly become amateur epidemiologists tracking the role of social deprivation, dispossession, wealth inequality, socioeconomic stresses and strains and so on. All of this in the, in the emergence and spread of COVID-19. And in one sense, this is quite new to us all, but actually epidemiologists have been producing some of the sharpest critiques of neoliberalism in, in recent years as well. Think for example of Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, The Spirit Level, uh, this marvelous book that came out, I can't remember, 10, 15 years ago, arguing that societies that are more equal will tend to be healthier in all sorts of different ways, the actual health of individuals, but also fewer social problems such as violence, mental illness, obesity, and so on. And, and their, their book, The Spirit Level, helped pop to popularize a thesis that the left has known for a very long time, which is to improve human health, you don't just need to invent uh, marvelous new medicines and vaccines. Just focusing on, on the social conditions is, uh, is absolutely critical sanitation, uh, equality. And so we've seen with COVID-19, how did it crash into Britain? First, it was the posh parts of London as the skiers came home from Ishgul, from Chamonix, uh, down into Pimlico and Chelsea, and, and the disease began to spread. And then, but then increasingly it spread out across uh, the nation and became more and more endemic in, in the poorer areas where it finds its ideal habitat to nest in, high density housing, more people per house, many, many, many workers with no choice but to go to work, uh, more black and Asian people, those two categories belong together. And, and on this last point, black and Asian people, um, I think it's, it's worth noticing the role of the, the part that's played by social movements as well in fighting against the disease. I mean, there's, and in suffering from the disease, more importantly, there's no doubt that popular awareness of the vulnerability of black and Asian people has become higher thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement. So BLM helped directly to save lives um, by fostering the recognition that, that racism is itself directly a serious, very serious underlying health condition. Um, in my own workplace, we can see this. My manager is a complete bastard, as anyone who's looked at my Facebook feed will know. Um, to any members of staff deemed not vulnerable, they, are, they have been just absolute bastards. Um, but if you're a BAME in my workplace, you're classed as vulnerable. Um, and so you're allowed to teach online if you wish, the rest of us have to go and teach on campus. And this is, so this is an example really of class struggle, the producing structures or forms of thought that reduce, that, that, that lessen inequality in this small, small example. But obviously the more powerful tendencies are in the other direction. Um, in the, and so in the current crisis, we're seeing a horrific polarization um, on all the usual lines. COVID is is provoking trends towards greater inequality, which is making society's immune system even weaker for when the next uh, pandemic comes, comes around. Um, so that was my second point. The third one concerns the economy, economic collapse. Economic historians in, if you, in, a, in the future will probably look back and they'll see 
a long crisis from 2008 onwards um, with an important inflection in 2020. Um, so by most measures, globalization, for example, came to an end in 2008. Trade wars kicked off, growth resumed, but very, very slowly. And then in 2019, the world economy was beginning to tip into crisis, but COVID came along and tipped it off the edge. And with it have gone lots of the old preconceptions that, that we've come used to over the last 10, 20 years. Austerity is no longer the pole star for governments to follow. Uh, and, and neoliberalism may well survive this, um, this pandemic, um, but it will probably emerge in a rather more statist form. Um, it'll be exceptionally in, indebted. So another massive austerity hit will probably um, be imposed in, or they'll attempt to impose it in a, in a few years' time. At the moment in Britain, the Tories are splashing the cash and they're benefiting from that, which makes it tough for a Labour to resort to um, its, some of its usual um, demand. The demand for, for extra spending worked well in conditions of austerity, but not so well any longer, not right now at the moment. COVID is probably gonna lead to a pretty long-term squeeze on, on growth. Um, we'll see, it's hard to predict. Um, quite likely, I, maybe a deflationary spiral, maybe inflation, maybe both, we'll, we'll see, probably inflation. At the moment, the scale of bankruptcies and unemployment is soaring. As you know, even in the relatively leafy part of town I live in, in London, um, the number of boarded up shops in the shopping city is phenomenal. And so the suddenness of this impoverishment and the scale of it is, is staggering. And the, therefore the potential for rapid politicization is, and for rapid swings in, in consciousness and movements is, is, well, it's obvious and we can discuss. Um, next point is I wanted to suggest talk about briefly is, is welfare and the state. So if you think back to March, there was an exceptionally violent lurch to all society's coordinates, and it felt as though the whole future was getting shaken up. In its suddenness and it, in its universality, the, the all-round effects, in the sense of risk as well, and the reality of death, uh, it really felt comparable in some respects to, to, to war. Um, but of course, this is a health emergency, not a, a, a military emergency. So the side of the state that comes to the fore is not the side for war, it's the side for welfare. And so the state comes into its role as protector of society, or aspires to anyway. Um, and in some respects, of course it is. Um, and in Britain, this is especially powerfully felt because the health service is, is a progressive institution within a national casing. It's even there in the name, obviously. And so the pull of reformism, the gravity of reformism in such a circumstance is, is immensely powerful for obvious reasons. And it poses problems for revolutionaries in formulating a clear message. Um, so the fundamental way of dealing with this disease is really for everyone to be civic minded and caring. Um, but the government wants us to be those things as well, but it doesn't really want to pay for it. Um, so in a sort of very basic level, socialists find themselves aligned with the government, but obviously this is a government that's completely failing. Um, but what I'm trying to say is it's not like a war where we simply say, stop, um, stop the war. Um, there are some socialists who are, who are saying stop lockdown, um, but I'll come on to that debate in a minute. From the framework I've been outlining, there's, there's an easy slip for some towards supporting coercion and surveillance. The state, it's said, is, is our protector. It's protecting us as best it can from the disease. So it has to threaten to fine those who transgress it in the interests of all. It has to force people to behave decently, to social distance and so on. And the state has been promoting an increased role of the big digital companies in organizing our lives. It has to do that because we need um, uh, an app that works. 
and only Apple can work or Google can work the app. So this is infiltrating the big data companies, the big digital companies, even further into um, into very powerful positions in our lives through the pretext, so to speak, of assisting the state in a public health emergency. Um, I mean, what do you? What do we say at this point? The tradi one of the traditional slogans of socialism is nationalize the commanding heights of the economy. Nowadays, those commanding heights are Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. Um, so that's something, anyway, and that's a rather trickier question. Well, I'm not trying to suggest that repression and surveillance do not work. And to a degree, they do. My guess is that those countries around the world that are seeing the lowest death, death rates are either countries with geographical luck, so sparse population, young population, not very mobile population, or they're the least neoliberal countries and the more equal ones, so with a better social immune system, or they're countries with past experience of epidemics, recent experience, a lot of countries in East Asia with SARS and so on. Uh, but also China um, is a country with a highly repressive authoritarian state, and part, that's presumably part of the reason why China's dealt with it in the later stages more effectively. That said, obviously on the left, we need to argue against coercion and against repression, against fines, and instead for a strategy of education, civic mindedness, mutual aid groups, empowering communities, and above all, state support for those who have to self-isolate. So the locate, test, trace, isolate, and support message that's coming out from Indie Sage and that we're all supporting, so on. But where in this picture do we put lockdowns? There's a brilliant essay by um, a Marxist, a Greek Marxist, Panayotis Sotiris, in the current historical materialism journal. He makes a case for absolute opposition to lockdowns. Um, it's a brilliant essay, but I think he's wrong to absolutize opposition to lockdowns. Um, I think instead one needs to operate on several tracks at once with that type of argument, the autonomist argument, Panayotis' argument, to build from below, mutual aid, etc. Also opposing authoritarian forms of lockdown. Um, but finally, building through campaign groups and through union organizations, organizations that can demand that the state provide proper support, full support for people isolating during lockdown because, and this is what's missed by the total anti-lockdown arguments, like it or not, only the state has resources to disperse money on the kind of scale that can make a lockdown um, effective in getting rates down to the level where uh, test and trace can actually work. Now, of course, lockdowns come with an absolutely horrific cost, unemployment, social polarization, etc. That They can't be a demand as such. Um, and I'm certainly not arguing for a one-size-fits-all position on, on lockdowns applicable everywhere, etc. And also, there's a bit of confusion over the semantics. When I, when I say lockdown, all I'm meaning is a framework in which, you know, for instance, people can meet people meet others outside, but indoors, uh, one's confined to one's bubble until the lockdown is lifted. Um, because in Britain, with hospitalization rates soaring and so hospitals some, in some regions about to become overwhelmed, I think this question of lockdown is, at the moment, to this extent, a, a left-right issue. The Farage's new party, the Brexit party essentially, and the Tory right are adamantly anti-lockdown because they're social Darwinists, basically. And the left can join with them, even though they're framing the argument in libertarian terms. Um, we're ag against lockdowns as a solution, but you know most people are. Lockdowns are a temporary necessity. In certain cases, they're being completely ineptly handled by the government. And our, you know, we on the left are having to push for an alternative way of doing them. Nonetheless, I don't think we can be absolutely opposed. A, a, a radical government could easily um, uh, deal with the situation quite swiftly. Um, Cancelling Trident, 
uh, using the billions freed up to pay people to stay at home for uh, a month um, and, uh, you know, have a good time or at least a relatively comfortable time, if not a good time. That's not, obviously not where we are right now, but it's, it's the aspiration at moments such as this. So I'll just come to a close by saying, um, you know, uh, at the moment, British political scene is horribly frustrating, I, I, I find, because the government is utterly corrupt, inept, and those two go together, neoliberal, centralized test and, test and trace has been, a, has, been, has been a joke, expensive joke, corrupt joke. The government is losing legitimacy, it's losing trust. And these, these problems are not just on the Tories' ticket. Uh, Labour prepared the way. It was Labour who brought McKinsey into, and, and all the rest of them, these consultancies, into the management of the welfare state, which they are now chewing bits off. Um, but meanwhile, Labour is doing nothing. Labour is no longer an opposition at all. Its critique of the government is purely on competence, nothing else. And a lot of the left is quite paralyzed, mesmerized by the scale of this crisis, frustrated by the reluctance of people to come out on the streets, um, which is being made harder by the authoritarian conditions of, of lockdown. Um, and some are demoralized by the collapse of Corbynism. Um, the mutual aid groups were wonderful, but they, they're dormant now by and large. So what we have is micro struggles in the workplaces, Increasingly, next spring, housing will become a major site of struggle as evictions, uh, uh, I, uh, as evictions take off. Um, but at least now we have the zero COVID uh, movement or campaign, I should say. It's not yet a movement, um, which has the potential to bring the far left together with housing campaigners, with trade unions, with the labor left, and to crystallize a program to fight for. And uh, on Saturday, Zero COVID campaign is called a, a demonstration. I can't tell you how much I'm missing demonstrations. Sometimes, when you live in London, um, I mean, it's so, so easy for us to get to demonstrations, much easier than these long coach journeys that I remember when I was a kid in five coming down overnight coaches to London, that sort of thing. But, um, but, uh, but there are so damn many demonstrations. So sometimes you get they, you get, get almost bored of them, but now it's been months. Uh, how much I miss the demonstration. So Saturday at last, we're being encouraged to get out on the streets in ones and twos, holding placards uh, for the zero COVID campaign. And um, I look forward to the, in the discussion hearing about uh, the ideas um, you have for how to take this further. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much.